Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the next installment of uh, the Swiss CAT seminar. Our speaker for today will be Virgil Constantin. We'll be talking about toposes and hopefully teach us all about category theory. Take it away. Yeah, okay, thank you. So welcome everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to this talk. Um, thank you for Bruno, uh, who's not here, and uh, Alex from Geneva for organizing the seminar and uh, giving me the opportunity to speak here. So I'm very excited because it's my first talk as a, as a PhD and, um, and what an audience for a first talk. I don't know that many people would be interested into toposes, but, uh, but that makes me happy. So, so yeah, toposes, so what are those? It's weird because many people have heard about them, but not that many people know what they are. And uh, I, don't know really, I don't really know why, but I feel like, and I, I know that some people are scared about them. So we'll try to demystify this today. And so toposes, they're just plain categories uh, which on which we add, uh, which we require them to have extra structure, extra properties. And these properties, they're nice because it's like they found the right balance between uh, being general enough and not being too general in the sense that they're general enough because there are a lot of different examples that uh, we can deal with. And they're not too general in the sense that uh, as we can, as we will see, uh, all toposes behave in some ways in the same way, and uh, a way to see that is to see them uh, from this different perspective. And within each perspective, we'll see that they all have some similar uh, behaviors, and, uh, and that's why we we want to 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 observe today. And so, I think not everyone is familiar uh, with categories, and so. Uh, of course, this talk is about categories, so it's possible that you you have a hard, hard time at some point. But every every definition that we do uh, in categories, it's motivated by common examples uh, that we we have in real life mathematics. So I'll try to I'll try to to emphasize these examples uh, so that you can still have the intuition of what is going on. And whenever you see a category, you can just replace it by the the, the category of sets, which I'll explain what it is and and uh, and in interpret everything from this point of view, always keeping in mind that, uh, that what I say about categories can be generalized, not only to the category of sets, but other categories as well. So, so we'll explore these three point of views uh, of a topos as a generalized space, as a generalized category of sets, and as a generalized theory. And so I I'll first uh, say about the definition of a category. So a category, you should see it as a bunch, a class of objects, uh, with uh, between two objects, uh, you will want to consider a set of morphism between them, which I'll denote with these notations. And this morphism should be able to be, they are composable uh, if, if that is well defined. And this composition should be associative and unital in the sense that for every object, there's an identity morphism uh, which behaves like a unit for the composition law. And uh, the objects of the category is usually, it will be some common mathematical structure that you know of, and that will be the objects and the morphism, they will be the structure preserving maps, the natural tr structure preserving maps between those objects. And so to be sure that we have the, the right intuition, I'll, I'll, say, I'll give a, a few examples. So you can consider the category of sets uh, whose object, objects, these are the sets, and the, and the morphism, these are the plane functions. Or you can consider the category of groups with groups and groups homomorphism, or the category of spaces with spaces and continuous maps, or even graphs and graph morphism, and whatever you can think of is probably a category. And uh, there's a, an important category, it's the category of categories. So there's a notion of morphism, structure preserving morphism between two categories. And that's what is called a functor, so it will preserve the composition law and the units of it. And an important thing about functors is that we can assemble them together to create a category of functors. And the, I won't say what the, the, the morphism between functors are, but the point is that you can take functors, put them together in a category, and then they become the main object of study of that category. And that will be a little bit important later, but I'll say more uh, in the time at the time being. And so now uh, let's see what is uh, a topos. So an elementary topos, uh, it's a category which have three uh, distinct properties. So we ask that it has finite limits, a subobject classifier, 
I mean, it's Cartesian clause. And so I'll spend five to 10 minutes uh, describing what are these. And then at the end of that, I hope that you will all understand what is a topos. So I'll start with finite limits. So a finite limits, uh, a category has finite limits. Whenever uh, I have two objects, X and Y, uh, I require that there uh, an appropriate notion of product exists. So this product, it's really what you believe uh, it will be in standard categories. And not all categories have products. For example, the product of two fields, it's not a field. And so the category of fields, it doesn't have products, even though that's not a, a real proof of that fact. And uh, we also require uh, our categories to have uh, things called a terminal object, which will be noted by the uh, one. And it's an object such that for every other object in my category, there's a unique map going. There's a unique map going into that object. And uh, for example, uh, in the category of sets or groups or topological spaces, I take one to be the singleton. And for every every other object, there's a unique map mapping everything into the point. And so this object is terminal in those categories. So which you should always think of a terminal object as a point. And we also require uh, equalizers to exist. And uh, in the category of sets, uh, an equalizer of two uh, two parallel maps between X and Y. It's the, the sets of elements in X, which will equalize uh, my, my two functions. And so you can categorify this notion in any category and you, you require that these exist. And so if a category of these three uh, properties, we say that it has finite limits. Okay, great. So now we'll go to the important notion of a sub-object classifier. And uh, as it's usual in categories, I'll emphasize uh, a property that the category of sets or other categories have and highlight a certain property and then take this as, as a definition in a general category. So in the category of sets, uh, we have a, a famous bijection. Uh, so if I have a, have a set X, there's a bijection between the subset of X and the functions from X to the two element sets. And so how is this uh, bijection defined? Well, it takes a subset A and it sends it to the characteristic function of A. And the characteristic functions, it takes a point and it sends it to zero if X is in A and one if X is not in A. And how can, how can I recover my subset from this function? Well, I, I can just take the pre-image of zero and that way I'll recover A. And so this gives me a bijection. And so using more uh, categorical notation, uh, the left-hand sets uh, ca uh, can be written as the set of sub-object of X and the right-hand set can be written as the, as the home set in the category of set from X to this two element set. And these two element set, I'll give it a special name, Omega. It's called a sub-object classifier because maps into that object well, it really classifies the sub-objects of X. That's why it's called it sub-object classifiers. And so I take this as a general definition in a general category. So a sub-object classifier would be an object such that maps into that object correspond precisely to the sub-object of X. And, uh, and I require furthermore that this bijection is natural. So it's a precise precise categorical statement, but intuitively it means that when defining this bijection, uh, I only uh, I did not make non-canonical choices. And so the, the most famous example for non-natural morphism uh, or isomorphism is the isomorphism of a vector space with its dual. So it's well known, but to define this isomorphism, I really need to specify a basis of my vector space and choosing a basis it's not canonical because there are plenty of bases and none of them is really uh, should be preferred uh, over the others. So this one is not natural. And um, okay, so a category having this object is called, uh, is having a sub-object classifier. So we already defined two notions of a topos. And the third one, it's being Cartesian closed. So again, I'll emphasize properties that we know in famous categories and then take this as a general definition um, in a, in a general category. So in the category of sets, the set of functions, uh, well, it's a set, so it's an object of the category. The same thing happened with topological space. I can equip the, the, the set of functions between two spaces 
uh, with the compact open topology so that it becomes itself an object of my category of spaces. Same thing, uh, same thing happened with chain complexes. Uh, the set of chain map can be enriched into a chain complex, so it's itself an object of my category. And same for modules, uh, the set of modules, it's itself, it, it itself has a R module structure. And so it's itself an object. And it's this property that we want to, to generalize in some category. And so a category is said to be Cartesian closed if uh, for any pair of object A, B, there's an exponential object uh, B to the A. And it should be thought as the set of maps which, which we can equip with additional structures so that it becomes an object of my category. And so they are defined uh, by a universal property. And it's this, this universal property is that the map from a product uh, correspond precisely to map into that, that exponential. And this one also should be natural. And in the last two, so these two categories, they're Cartesian closed. Uh, and these one, they're not really Cartesian closed, but the idea is the same. Uh, they're, they satisfy a, a slightly more general uh, uh, notion. And, but the idea, the intuitive idea is the same. That's why I put them here. And so a category satisfying these three orange uh, properties, uh, that is a topos. So now you all know uh, what these are. I don't think there's nothing too complicated in, in them, I guess. And uh, now we'll want to see some examples, of course. Uh, so the, the, the most prominent example is the category of sets. Uh, it's, whenever you think about toposes, there's always a, the notion of sets involved. And uh, the, notion, the finite sets, they, all, they also uh, a topos and any functor category is going into a category of sets it's a topos and so uh, we have many examples of this uh, concrete examples for example the the category of uh, of collections of sets indexed by a set it's a topos the category of set having a g action on it it's a topos the category of graph the category of simply shell sets these are all particular case of functor categories Another example, which I'll come back uh, very shortly, is the category of, uh, whenever I'm giving a, a space X, I can consider uh, the category of sheaves, and uh, I'll come back to it in a second, and it's uh, this one is a topos. And uh, maybe some non-example. So these, there are toposes. And the category of groups, it's not a topos because it doesn't have a sub-object classifier. And the reason is that uh, if it had, there should be a bijection between uh, the sub the set of subgroups of a group G of all groups G, with the set of group homomorphism from G to a subobject classifier, and this bijection uh, it should be given as it, as it was the case for sets. It takes a homomorphism, and it gives back the kernel of F. So the kernel of F it's a subgroup of G, so it's great, but it's a normal subgroup. And so if a group G has a non-normal subgroup H, it cannot be classified by a map. So the category of group doesn't have a sub-object classifier, the category of categories neither, the category of fields, it doesn't have a terminal object because if there is a field homomorphism between two fields, then they have the same characteristic. So if for all fields there is a map into a single field, all fields would have the same characteristics. So it's obviously not true. And the category of topological spaces doesn't have a sub-object classifier uh, neither. And so usually all categories that have a, a algebraic flavor, they're not toposes. And that's something to keep in mind. So these these are not. And okay, so now we've seen some examples, and uh, I wanna I wanna start by uh, viewing toposes as a generalized space. Uh, please stop me if anyone has any question. Uh, if uh, there's something that is unclear, I'll be happy to answer. So One question. yeah. So uh, how do you define the set of uh, subobjects? Like in the definition yeah. of a subobject classifier? Yeah. In a general category? No, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, in general, there's a notion. Uh, well, let me write just this here. In, in a category, there's a notion of the monomorphism. Uh, are you OK with that notion? So I can uh, consider the sets of uh, monomorphism. So if I, I, I specify an object x. I can, I can consider the sets of monomorphism going into that object. And I can put an equivalence relation by taking isomorphism class of these. Uh, so if I have two sub-objects, uh, 
subobject of x, if there is an isomorphism making this diagram commute, uh, will identify these subobjects, and uh, the the set of subobjects is the set of monomorphism class into X. So it's not an object of my category; it's a, it's a set. Yeah. Okay. And so the main ingredient to see a, a topos as a generalized space uh, is the following uh, functor. So it turns out that we have an embedding of the category of topological spaces into the category of toposes, or maybe not, into the category of topos. And in this embedding, it takes a space X and it sends it to the category of sheaves on X. <clears throat> so I won't define precisely what is this category of sheaves, what is a sheaf, but I think I'll just give you the, the main uh, example of a sheaf. So given a space X, uh, so a sheaf in general, it would be a collection of sets, uh, but these sets would be connected to each other. And uh, this collection of sets, so F is a sheaf, so it will be a collection. It will be parameterized by the open sets of X and, and it will be a collection of sets. And they have some additional uh, properties and I want to illustrate this by the, the most famous example of a sheaf. And uh, this sheaf F, uh, so it's parameterized by the opens of X. And for each U, I consider the set of continuous maps from U to, to the real. And I want to emphasize the property of a shift by uh, making you notice that uh, continuous map from a, a, an open U are completely defined by what they are locally. So what I mean by that is that if my open is covered by uh, some other open spaces and uh, I have continuous maps from each UI to R, which are compatible in the sense that on the intersection of the UI and the UJ, they must be the same. Otherwise, it won't make sense to glue them together. Well, I can glue them together to get a map, to get a map from uh, U to R. And this map is uniquely defined by the, the, the FIs. <clears throat> and this property that elements uh, of my sets appearing in the sheaf are completely defined locally is the defining property of, uh, of sheaves. And, uh, but the, the main thing is that we have this embedding and we'll, we'll construct everything uh, from it. So, uh, to have an embedding, I need to have a category of toposes, and I didn't tell you what are the morphism in the category of toposes. So, of course, uh, we know that toposes, there are specific categories. So, <clears throat> a topos, it, it lives inside the category of categories, and there's the notion of functors between categories. So, the most obvious notion of uh, morphism between functors would be the notion of functors between those. Uh, but it turns out that uh, we want uh, this embedding to be uh, nicely behaved, to be the best kind of embedding possible. And that's the notion of a fully faithful functor. So if I consider only functors between toposes, uh, my, my embedding will be only faithful and it will not be full. What I mean by that is that whenever I'm given a, a continuous map between two spaces, this will induce by functoriality uh, a functor between the associated sheaves, right? And this function, uh, it's it's injective, but I really want it to be bijective so that my embedding will be nicely behaved. And so what I do, I just restrict the image of that function, and this will be this will give me the notion of morphism, the appropriate notion of morphism between toposes, and uh, the image of that morphism. It has a nice characterization, and these are exactly the functors from sheaves X to sheaves Y, such that they have a left adjoint. And the left adjoint, it, it's called left exact. Left exact, it means that it should preserve uh, finite limits. And so we characterize a continuous map by uh, these, these specific functors which have left, left, left exact, left adjoint. And these functors, they are called the geometric morphism between the associated sheaves. And so this is the appropriate notion of uh, of uh, structure preserving maps between toposes. 
it's one appropriate notion. We, we could consider others and and uh, we will take this as a, a notion of, uh, as the definition of a morphism into a topos. And it's called geometric morphism to topos. Topos is it's a pair of adjoint functors such that uh, the left adjoint, uh, it preserves finite limits. And, um, and that will be the, the notion that we take uh, for morphism into toposes. And so now I want to give you some kind of algorithm to see toposes as generalized space using this fully faithful embedding. And uh, so I wrote it there. So, so the first step is to consider your favorite topological or geometrical property that you can formulate into the category of spaces. Then if you want to have a chance to, to, to define it in terms of toposes, you need to be able to categorify it. So it should not involve points, but only morphism, uh, continuous maps between spaces. And then you need to characterize it in terms of sheaves uh, using, uh, I think it froze, sorry. Ah, sometimes it happens, sorry. I need to remove the battery and put it back. <laughs> <laughs> I was given this once. Yes, it works again. Uh, so using this this uh, embedding, uh, you need to characterize the, the your, your topological notion in terms of shifts so that now you live, you have a characterization, you have a property in the world of toposes. And then you take this as a general definition. So it's exactly what we did for morphism, uh, as I explained here. So we wanted to, to, to generalize the notion of continuous maps between uh, spaces. So I want to, to define this. And it's already a categorical notion because these are just uh, uh, morphism in, into my uh, category of space. And then we characterized it in terms of sheaves by saying, well, this corresponds precisely to the geometric morphism between my sheaves. And now I take this as a definition, uh, as a continuous map between toposes, I say it's a geometric morphism. And uh, if my toposes here are, are sheaves on the space, they correspond precisely to the continuous map between my, my spaces involved. And so I can do that for many topological properties. Uh, suppose that I want to, 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 to generalize the notion of points uh, of a topos. So I want to, cut to, to generalize the notion of the set of points of a space X. So this is not a categorical notion. So I need to categorify it, and this corresponds precisely to the home set from the singleton to X, because the map, uh, the image of the points will give me a point of my space. And so I categorified my notion of points, and this by the above bijection, it corresponds precisely to the geometric morphism between the sheaves on my space one and the sheaves of X. And it turns out that the sheaves of, uh, of, a, of a singleton, it's just the category of sets. And so a geometric morphism between a uh, set and sheaves of X correspond precisely to a single point of my space. And so I can now take this as a definition of a point in the topos by saying it's a geometric morphism uh, from sets to my topos. And in fact, I can do that with so many topological properties. I can define what is a connected topos using this uh, algorithm. I can define what is an open or closed subtopos. And I can define what is the cohomology of a topos. And I can use topological tools and ideas to study toposes uh, from that perspective and many others. And it's in this way that toposes can be seen as uh, generalized spaces, from my point of view, at least. <clears throat> and uh, OK, so now I want to change, uh, to make a change in perspective. Yeah, one question. Yeah. Um, this also sounds very topological. How does the name uh, geometry work? Um, yeah, that's a, a great question. So, in geometry, at, at, at least in modern geometry, uh, there's the notion of schemes, and the notion of scheme it's a it's a space, but it's enriched with a, a very complicated structure. And then in in algebraic geometry, they 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 study the sheaves on X, where X is a scheme. And I think that's where the geometrical part comes in. Uh, I don't know much more about it, uh, I would say. But uh, the, so it becomes much more difficult. <laughs> then it becomes much more difficult. And uh, yeah, <laughs> totally. Um,
So now we want to see toposes as a generalized category of sets. So we want to uh, have a change of perspective. And first of all, I want to first see the category of set as a special topos, because we know it's a topos, but it has much more properties that we uh, might ask other topos to, to have. And um, we can characterize these properties in three distinct properties that the category of set it has. So it's a topos, but it's also well-pointed. And this refers to the fact that the singleton set is very important because every set is a, is a disjoint union of a singleton. And uh, elements of sets are characterized by maps from the singleton. So the singleton plays a specific role in the category of sets. And this well-pointed notion, it has something to do with that. Uh, it has a set of natural numbers, which is useful to, which is very important to define the notion, inductive notions. So uh, this is uh, something we should consider in a topos. <clears throat> and also it, it satisfies the axiom of choice because our meta theory is, is, is using choice. So, uh, and then Lovier, uh, I think in the 60s or 70s, he had this idea that he would want to, 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 to find a different axiomatization of set theory. So at that time, there were the, the usual axiomatization of set theory, which is ZFC, but it uses these long chains of uh, memberships between sets, and it's really not intuitive. And uh, he thought, okay, but maybe uh, set uh, the carrier of set being a well-pointed topos with natural number objects and axiom of choice could maybe characterize completely what the what the sets mean in the usual sense of uh, the, the theory of sets in ZFC. And so he tried to axiomatize uh, this notion <clears throat> in a first order theory precisely. And uh, he, he would want it to be equivalent to ZFC. So to, we would have another theory that axiomatizes, that axiomatizes uh, our usual uh, set theory. And <clears throat> that's what is called the, the elementary theory of the category of sets. So it's a first order theory. So uh, I want to first uh, recall what, what is ZFC, what is the usual uh, set theory that we consider. So it's a first order logic, it's a first order uh, theory. And so there are things that are called sets and there's a binary relations on sets and then some axiom holds. So there are function ex extensionality, there's the pairing axiom, there's a power set axiom, the axiom of comprehension, well, there are all of these axioms. And, and now ETCS, it's also a first order theory, but it's based on the more categorical flavor. So there are things called sets, of course, we, we should have if we want to axiomatize sets. And, but now instead of having a primary notion of membership, we have a primary notion of functions. So in for two sets, I have a primary notion of functions, uh, something we call function between two sets, and then some axiom holds. And what do these axioms say? Well, it says first that uh, functions should be composable. It says that you know, the composition should be associative and unital, and then uh, so that uh, our theory behaves like, uh, like a category. And then we should say that it should have finite limits and a sub object classifier and Cartesian clause so that we arrive to the notion of the topos. And then we still need to ax axiomatize the fact that it should be a well-pointed topos with natural number objects and satisfying the axiom of choice. And so now we have a first order theory and uh, we want to, to, to know how it relates to ZFC because we, want, we would like it to be uh, an axiomatization of set theory. And it turns out that these are almost equivalent it turns out that uh, ZFC is slightly stronger than uh, ETCS. ETCS. Uh, that means that every model of ZFC, it's a model of ETCS. And uh, the, the converse is not true. And uh, here I've put the word slightly, so it's not a precise statement. But uh, in fact, we know exactly to which part of ZFC uh, do ETCS corresponds to. And it's uh, something called uh, restricted uh, Zermelo plus choice. And this is equivalent to ETCS. And uh, the restricted Zermelo with choice, it's almost ZFC. We just uh, modified one axiom of ZFC. And, uh, and that's what, uh, and the theory of ETCS, it's equivalent to the theory of uh, restricted Zermelo with choice. And so, so we can say that Lovier uh, succeeded in, in defining a new axiomatization. And this offers us a new point of view on set theory, because now we can study uh, set theory with the, all these famous theorem, com completeness theorem, and 
the continuum hypothesis and all these hypotheses that we would like to show it's independent or not of, uh, of ZFC. Now we would like to do the same with ETCS and because it's more intuitive, like functions are more intuitive, this axiomatization is way more intuitive than ZFC. Uh, it offers new, a, new, a new perspective on, on these questions. Uh, okay, so now we've seen how the category of sets is a specific topos, but now we want to see how the topos can be seen as a generalized category of sets. And so examples of topos, as we've seen, uh, for example, the topos of functors from the natural numbers to sets, we can think of it as a set which is varying through time. And the category of sheaves on a space can be thought as a set which is varying through space. And the category of sets can be thought as the category of constant sets. I'm just sorry to interrupt. There's a there's a question in the in the chat. It's being asked uh, what axiom is different uh, for for it to be equivalent to ETCS. Uh, so it's not missing, but it's modified. It's the axiom of comprehension, uh, which says that. Uh, uh, what does it say? It says that uh, this axiom of comprehension. It says that if I have a formula uh, phi, well, I, I want to be able to, to, to create the sets of uh, formula of elements so that my formula is, uh, sorry, such my, so that my formula is valid. Uh, we want to, to, to be able to define class using formulas and that's the axiom of comprehension. And uh, so it appears in ZFC and it also appears in a restricted, uh, in restricted Zermelo uh, plus choice. But it's a, it's a little bit modified in the sense that all quantifiers uh, are required to have some kind of upper bound. And uh, I think it's a bit technical. I, I don't know much more about it. Does that answer your question, Maurice? I guess it will. You had a question? Ah, uh, they hear me through through this computer. No, right, right. <laughs> Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> it would have been a okay. Okay, so let's continue. And so, because these examples shows us that we can see these these specific toposes as generalized sets varying through something, uh, we can use our intuition of sets to to reason about these toposes, and uh, and and it's great. And you might say, okay, but uh, so it's just it's just a mental technique uh, to 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 study toposes, but in fact, it's much more than that, and this can be made very precise. Uh, in fact, it's completely valid to use set-like reasoning and set-like language in any topos, and that's what's called the internal language of a topos. And so, if I'm working with a with a topos E, and I have some object A, it's completely valid to pretend that my object is a set, so I can pretend that it has elements and I can work with these elements and do statements and do proofs, just like if I was in the category of sets, even though I'm not. And then there's a dictionary uh, that allows me to translate this set-like language into uh, a real concrete statements about my toposes. And so I, I want to explain that a little bit. Uh, so this is called the internal language of a topos or the Mitchell Benabou language. And um, and so to work in any topos, I can use set-like reasoning, but I have a big restriction is it's that I need to use intuitionistic logic. And uh, as long as I use intuitionistic logic, whatever I can prove in the category of sets is, will be true in any topos, uh, using a, a dictionary to translate uh, these statements. And so what is intuitionistic logic? Uh, it's like classical logic, but I cannot use these three uh, formulas which says that a property is true or not true. That's called the law of excluded middle. I cannot use it. I cannot uh, remove uh, double negations and I cannot use the axiom of choice. And uh, if I do that and I reason uh, in a usual way without using these, um, I'm working uh, in what's called intuitionistic logic. And uh, why people are interested in that is that this uh, will make us do uh, mathematics that are called constructive in the sense that uh, if I want to prove that an object exists uh, with some property, I cannot just say, okay, it exists, uh, it exists somewhere, but I don't know what it looks like or where it lives. Uh, I cannot say that. I need to be able to construct it and to give it to you. And that's why it's called constructive mathematics. 
And so let's see examples. So these examples come from algebraic geometry. And it's a guy, uh, Ingo Blechschmidt, he wrote his whole PhD thesis uh, uh, full of examples uh, using this internal language to prove facts in algebraic geometry. Uh, and so on the left-hand side, uh, it's what I call the it's what is called the internal language. It's, so it's statements that are that we can state in the category of sets. So I'm working in the topos of set on the left side, and on the right side I'm working in any topos. And there is a dictionary that tells me how to translate things from the internal language to facts about my topos, and I can I can go both ways. And so uh, with that in mind, a, a simple ring, uh, a simple ring will correspond to a sheaf of ring. And the uh, R module will correspond to a sheaf of OX modules. So these are uh, algebraic geometrical uh, notions. And a finitely generated one will correspond to a sheaf of finite types. And now anything that can be said and proved using intuitionistic logic about modules will be automatically be true using my dictionary. Uh, it will translate to a theorem about sheaves uh, of modules, uh, which can be much more complicated. And a simple example, a toy example of that, is that if I have a short exact sequence of modules such that the two other ones are finitely generated, the guy in the middle is finitely generated, and I can, I can prove that using intuitionistic logic. So I can use my dictionary and translate that fact into the topos of sheaves uh, on a scheme X. And when I translate it, so I don't need to prove things again. Uh, it's already done on the left-hand side. And this will give me the, the theorem that if I have a short exact sequence of sheaves, uh, such that the two other ones are of, are of finite type, but the middle one will be of finite type as well. And this is a toy example, but there are lots of much more complicated examples, because this is, I remember in my algebraic geometry course, it was, you need to understand what's going on with shapes of finite types. It's already, it's not that direct. And um, there's a, a, a lemma in algebraic geometry, I think it's called uh, the Grothendieck generic freeness lemma. And it's said to be pretty hard. I don't know its statement, uh, but it's, it, it's equivalent using the internal language to the statement that a finitely generated vector space does not not have a basis. In intuitionistic logic, it does not that does not imply that the vector space has a basis because I cannot remove the not not. But we don't care because I can translate this fact into the algebraic geometry, and this gives me a pretty hard lemma, and so I'm happy about it. And much more can be can be can be done that way. And so there's a nice uh, illustrative pictures. Uh, that I like, uh, that I took from his PhD thesis. So here, here you have a, a mathematician, the external mathematician. So she's studying uh, shift theory and uh, from an outer perspective. So she's really studying shift theory without having the knowledge of internal language. And so she's having a pretty hard time proving things about shifts of finite type. And on the other hand, uh, there's this young mathematician. She just uh, followed a course on uh, commutative algebra or linear algebra. And she's just applying these results of linear algebra into the, the topos of sheaves, and she's getting pretty uh, decent results about uh, sheaves. And uh, and so she's having a great time, uh, apparently. So, yeah. so now I want to change one last time. Uh, I want to do a uh, change of perspective and uh, and see toposes as a generalized theory. Any questions? Great. So I, I want to recall uh, the classical uh, model theory what we do in classical model theory. So suppose you have a, a theory T uh, expressed in um, first order logic. So it can be the, the theory of groups or the theory of fields, the theory of smooth manifolds of whatever objects you like. It's probably, uh, it's probably, it's likely that it can be expressed in first order logic. And classical model theory uh, will want to interpret the theory. So it, they want to consider models of that theory uh, inside the category of sets, uh, as as says this uh, Wikipedia page, uh, which says that the structure uh, will be a set along with some extra structure interpreting uh, my language, and so I can depict that. Uh, I can. It's the same thing as saying that models of my theory should be in the category of sets. But now, I can say, okay, but what if I want? Uh, I want to create a model, and instead of having a set with some structure interpreting my language, I want to take first a topological space and then adding some structure to interpret my language. It seems like a, a reason, reasonable thing to do. And uh, I can also say, okay, what, are, what if I want to interpret 
uh, that you have group in the category of graphs. So I take a graph and I enrich it with the to interpret the the language of my theory. And I would want I would I might want to to be able to consider models into the category of graphs. And the same thing happened for for all categories. And uh, and so from this point of view, a natural question to ask is. Is, does there exist a category C? So given a specific theory T, does there exist a category C which uh, most represents the, the most natural environment in which to study the models of my theory? Because we always consider models in the category of sets, but maybe for the theory of simply shell set, maybe it's, it's, better con it's better to consider models in some other categories which will tell me more about the theory uh, itself. And that's... That's the question we want to answer positively in in this section, and uh, and to start for starters, I want to make sure that we're on the same page of what I mean by a model of a theory inside another category uh, than the category of sets, because a model of the theory of groups inside the category of sets it's just a group, and uh, that that's all right. But what is a group inside another category? So I consider my my, my first order uh, theory of groups. So it's made of a language uh, which is single sorted and it has a multiplication symbol, an inverse symbol and a neutral element symbol. And uh, now I can uh, formulate the axioms of a group uh, within that language, which says that the multiplication should be associative, the inverse, well, it should be an inverse and uh, the neutral element should be a neutral element. So that's just my first order theory of groups. And so what I mean uh, by, uh, oops, uh, what I mean by uh, a model, so th this thing should be read as uh, what is a model of the theory of groups in inside my category C. So I need to interpret, I need to interpret my language first. And so uh, for my sort, uh, uh, it will just correspond to an object. My multiplication symbol should correspond to a real multiplication in my category. And my inverse symbol should correspond to an inverse and my constant should uh, be interpreted by a map from the terminal objects, uh, keeping in mind that maps from a singleton correspond to, to points. And, and now I want to make sure that uh, these axioms are satisfied uh, together, uh, applied with this data. And uh, the three axioms, when stated using uh, categorical language, uh, sorry for that, uh, it just means that these three diagrams commute. So the first one states that uh, my multiplication is associative. The first one that my neutral element is really a neutral element, and my last one expresses uh, the inverse of uh, the inverse. And so that data uh, is the data of a model of my theory of groups inside a category, a random category with which has finite products. And so I can assemble them together to form the category of models of the theory of groups inside a category C. And uh, I want to make sure that uh, what we do uh, makes sense. And for that, I want to make sure that with this definition, if I take C, the category of sets, I, I, I really get the usual models. So the, I really get the category of groups uh, in the end. And so to, to define a model of a group inside a category, I required it to have finite products. Otherwise, the notion of multiplication uh, couldn't make any sense. But now if I want to consider other theories which have a richer language, uh, ah, sorry, Let, let's see examples first, my bad. Uh, so if I, a model of the theory of groups inside a category of smooth manifold recovers the notion of Lie groups, and the notion of group in the category of simply shell sets recovers the notion of simply shell groups, and a group in the category of spaces, it's a topological group, and a group in the category of algebraic varieties, it's an algebraic groups. And so intuitively now it makes much more sense to consider models of theories inside other categories than the category of sets because do it, uh, by doing that, we can recover uh, famous mathematical structures that we, we work with uh, on a daily basis. And I can just, and so these are just models of the simple theory of groups instead of considering the theory of D groups in the category of sets, which is much more complicated. And so as I've said, uh, we required our category to have finite products to, re to, to define what a multiplication uh, in a model would be. But now if I consider richer theories, uh, such as the theory of categories, if I want to interpret the theory of categories inside another category, I will need it to have pullbacks. Otherwise, uh, I cannot interpret it. 
if I want to define the notion, I just close. Okay. If I want to define the notion of a torsion abelian group, now I will need infinite coproducts and finite limits. And if I want to interpret the theory of fields, I will need coproducts, finite limits, and a good notion of image. And so we see that the richer the theory gets, the more structure I need my category to satisfy um, if I want to interpret those theories. And so examples of these, uh, 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 a model of the theory of categories inside the, the category of groups uh, recovers the notion of cross module and a vector space objects in the category of sets having a jection recovers the notion of KG modules. So these are just examples. And, and so now there is a big class of categories uh, which have all of these properties. So in which all of these theories can be interpreted into and these are co-complete toposes because co-complete toposes, well, they have all these properties. And so we can thus interpret uh, all the theories I've, I've, tell, I've told you inside a topos. And in fact, there's a huge class of theories that I can interpret in a topos and these are called geometric theories. And it's a class of first order theories such that what we will require to, to get models of these theories uh, are properties that toposes have. And I won't tell you what this is, but I can tell you that there is a lot of geometric theories. Uh, so it's not a precise theorem, but maybe a reason for, for that is that for every first order theory T, so non-geometric, there exists an associated geometric theory T prime such that they have the same set model. So in classical model theory, where we consider only set models, every theory is equivalent to a geometric one. So this gives you intuitively that there is a lot of geometric theories. It's very expressive. These are very expressive. And uh, so this is already great. And uh, to, to, to go to the, to the final theorem answering the, the questions I asked you at the beginning, uh, I, I need to tell you about classifying objects. So on the right-hand side here, I have a, a mathematical structure that I'm interested into. And a natural notion, a natural question to ask is that, is there a, a, an object that classifies this structure? So it's well known that um, I don't know why it's there. It's well known that uh, cohomology class classes of a space are completely uh, classified by homotopy classes from X into an Eilenberg Maclean space of type AN. And so maps into that space classifies cohomology classes. In a similar way, uh, if I'm interested in principal G bundles, well, they correspond precisely to homotopy classes of maps into the classifying space BG. And uh, the subobject classifier, well, maps into it correspond precisely, they classify subobjects. And so, natural question to ask is given, given a geometric theory, <laughs> mm -hmm. given a geometric theory, uh, does there exist a topos which classifies uh, the, my, the models of my theory? And the, the answer is yes, uh, and that's a striking striking result, uh, which says that I'm not really comfortable with that. Uh, which says that for any geometric theory, there exists a classifying topos with the property that maps into this classifying topos while it classifies the models of my theory, and uh, this bijection should be natural in D, and uh, so we'll use naturality in, very shortly. But now nothing uh, forbids me to take models into my classifying topos. So by doing that, I replace uh, my topos D by into the classifying topos and I get a bijection from endomorphism of my classifying topos to models into the classifying topos. And the thing is that on the left side, there's a canonical element, of course, the identity element. And so this corresponds to a model in my classifying topos. And this model, it's called the universal model. And the reason is that uh, if I'm given a model of my theory in some mathematical universe D, well, it will correspond to a map. Uh, it will be classified by a geometric map F. And then using naturality, so naturality will give me a commutative diagram and reading the diagram will directly tell me that uh, my model M, which I took arbitrarily, 
it's in fact isomorphic to the to, to a geometric image of my universal model U. And so all models in all possible universes are generated by this universal model, which lives inside the classifying topos. And so uh, what we did here uh, is nicely uh, depicted by this picture I took from Olivia Carmelo's book. Uh, so the big star, the yellow star, it represents the classifying topos. And the other big shapes, these are all other random topos here, such that the, the topos of sets or the topos of graph or any other topos. And uh, the inside, the little shapes inside the, 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 the big shapes, they, they represent uh, models of my theory. And so there's this canonical model inside uh, the classifying topos, um, th this model. And the, the theorem tells me that every other model in every other topos and every other topos it's just a shadow it's just generated it, it's a geometric image geometric deformation of my universal uh, model and so what we did here is we switched from the perspective of set based model to the perspective of uh, all possible models in all possible toposes and this allowed us to have this very strong classification result and it, it shows us that when we restrict ourselves to the topos of set, it's like we don't have the, the optimal vision on the on the theory T and the, the symmetries and the and the, the invariants of my theory, they're best understood by uh, studying the, the universal model. And and that's why toposes are, are important. Uh, and um, one last thing. Uh, Every co-complete topos is in fact the, the classifying topos of some theory. So if I get a topos, there is exists a geometric theory such that my topos classifies this theory. And it's in that sense that the topos can be seen as a generalized theory. And, uh, and okay, so I, I think I want to conclude now uh, if there is no questions. So now I've told you how we can see toposes from multiple perspectives but it would be great if we could link this perspective together. And why, one way to see that, if I want to, to relate uh, the perspective of a generalized theory with the, the, the perspective, the point of view of a generalized space, is that uh, if I have a classifying topos, ET, and I want to see, it, to see it as a space, I can see it as the space of models of T. And so now, because I want to interpret it as a space, I can ask, what are these points that we've seen, uh, the points of a topos, that we've seen earlier. And so we, we, we saw that the points, they are the geometric morphism from set to my topos. But because the topos is classifying, this corresponds to the models, the set models of my theory. And so by uh, mixing different perspectives, we recover the, no the, 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 the classical fact that it's still important to consider uh, models of a theory inside the category of sets. And uh, and maybe if I want, and so what are maps uh, from a generalized space, so a topos to, to a classifying uh, to a classifying topos, it can be seen as a, uh, a universal family of models parameterized by, by my space X. And there are precise way to, to, make this, uh, to make this precise. And maybe a last thing, uh, if I want to, to mix the notion of uh, the, the perspective of a generalized theory with the generalized universe of sets, uh, I can hint you of how we could violate the the continuum hypothesis in a, in a topos. How could we show that uh, there exists a topos which does not validate the continuum hypothesis in which it is wrong? And one way to, to approach this problem is to write down a geometric theory which uh, in which the models are precisely the sets that lie in between the natural number objects uh, and the uh, and the object of the reals, which is the power sets uh, uh, of n, and if I if I can write down a geometric theory which expresses precisely uh, these objects, then I will know that there is a classifying topos for that theory, and inside that classifying topos there is a universal model, and so I'll get a universal model that will not satisfy the continuum hypothesis, and while it's not uh, while it will just be a topos, it will not be um, a category of sets, it will not be an element, a topos with a well pointed topos with a natural number and choice. I can massage uh, my model a little bit to get a, a model of sets, 
which uh, contradict the, the continuum hypothesis. Okay, th sorry, I, I have been a little over time, uh, but I hope uh, you followed it through. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm always for your questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Let's uh, thank Vajal for his talk. Okay, are there any questions for the speaker? Maybe one. So, oh, you have one. Um, so do you know any other like more difficult uh, properties in algebraic geometry than the finite exactness of finite, uh, being finite type of sheaves? That can be proven with this perspective that you showed from modules. Yeah, no, it's it's a great uh, question. Uh, I don't have a precise example uh, in my head because I don't know much about algebraic geometry. But there's this thesis I was telling you about. Uh, it's the, the first reference, Ingo Blechschmidt. So he uses the internal language of a topos in algebraic geometry, and in there he proves that using the internal language, uh, you can really prove pretty difficult theorems in algebraic. Uh, a geometry using only basic commutative algebra. So if you go uh, see this, so it's 200 pages long, but you, you will find many examples for that. And sorry, I don't, I don't have uh, one. Yeah, thanks for the reference, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, most of what I've, I've told uh, uh, in my talk, uh, it's in this article by Tom Neister, it's, it's, it's really great. And uh, it uses very simple language uh, to introduce topos. So I'll recommend that to anyone uh, being interested. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, maybe I'll ask a question. Um, then at some point in the talk, it seemed like, if I understood it correctly, like part of the motivation is to maybe come up with some sort of general theory well, as people do with category theory, some sort of general theory that you can use to apply to different areas of mathematics, like let's say group theory, graph theory, et cetera. Um, and so is, are there any big results where you have some something that's very easy to prove in super generality and then easy to maybe project down onto those smaller theories, if that question makes any sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. <laughs> There certainly are a lot of them. Uh, I, I don't think I have a specific term in, in mind, but uh, the, 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 the concept of category three to abstract things that we, we know in certain setup and try to define more abstractly using categorical language. And this will uh, induce or more, more imply uh, concepts uh, in other fields. And um, so I'm, I'm not sure what kind of term you're looking for. Maybe someone in the audience have one, but for example, a simple example is that <clears throat> we have the notion of product in, in any category. And uh, so we have a product of sets, we have a product of uh, groups, and these are very natural and they look uh, like each other, all of them. And we we were able, category theorists were able to, to categorify this notion. And so in some setup, the notion of products, it, it might be a little more unclear of what it should be. And a basic example, I think most of us, uh, when we first saw it, uh, we, we were a bit surprised when you consider the infinite products of uh, topological spaces, uh, the, the open sets, well, these are not uh, the infinite products of open sets. And uh, a reason for that, a categorical reason for that is that the, the appropriate categorical notion of infinite product in the category of space uh, becomes the, the, the usual product topology. And uh, this concept can apply for many things. So for example, if you're working with shields and you you, you wonder what is the, the appropriate notion of monomorphism or epimorphism or surjective map or injective maps. But because our underlying objects, these are not plain sets, it's some, it might be that it's a bit unclear um, what these notions should be. And so category theory would 
tell us what are the, the appropriate notions for that. And, uh, and I think there are many examples of that thing. Does this answer your question? Uh, Partly. Thank you. I, I think uh, I, maybe my question was uh, far too vague, but yeah. That, no, that, that's... I don't think it is. It's just that I don't have an example in mind. Sorry for that. That's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, were there any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Or also, you might have different uh, ways to categorize the same thing that actually are not the same. Thing yeah, totally. Uh, no, I think I just invented this to to make things more clear of how we could proceed to 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 abstract topological properties to to other topos. But it's true that it's not a rigorous uh, way to proceed, I guess. Okay. Okay. Um, are there, I think that was a question from that room. Are there any further questions? Not here. No. Okay. Uh, great. So, oh, sorry. Uh, so, if there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker one more time.